presentation on the first 50 years. And later on, I'll cite some people here who had to endure my phone calls as I tested their memory of the past. And they did very well, thank God. And they volunteered to not contradict me on anything I say tonight because they already cleared it. <laughs> um, in order to make this easier to take in, I'd like to point out that this 50-year this 50 period, which I'll cover in 45 minutes, splits into three rather distinct segments. The first segment is the early years of the club sort of getting started, from about 1933 up to uh, the beginning of World War II. For those of you not as old as I, that was 1941. After the war, in 1945, from 1945 to 1967, was another period of history that kind of blocks out. In that, the club made some attempts to get started again and uh, hung in there in spite of some very difficult times, but survived. Then comes the third period, which is uh, 1967 or so, on up to around 1984. Now we have some people tonight who really are featured in this, and at the end I want to acknowledge them and their contributions. So we'll do that. So, to begin, this now is the first period, which is prior to World War II, starting in about 1933. The story started in about 1933, according to Joe Strollin. K.R.E.C. in his February 23, 1992 letter to Toy Allerton, K1WYQ. Joe was especially famous for his humorous, creative packaging of crystal sets. Those of you who have seen his crystal sets will remember them easily. He took some unusual things like houses and made them crystal sets. He made a telegraph key into a crystal set. And I had one for a while of his that was a book that was really a crystal set. His memories of the early Norwalk Amateur Radio Association and the picture of him, you know, you got it. Yeah, we did it. Um, are not great, he says. The club was begun about 1933 in the clubhouse was located on York Street in Norwalk. York Street was then a, a connector from New Canaan Avenue to 36 Plattsville Avenue and later wiped out by the construction of I-95. If you look up here, here's New Canaan Avenue that comes down here and over to the railroad tracks, over to Main Street, uh, to route to under route, route 7 over to Main Street and the railroad tracks. Up here is Broad Street. I tried to find the exact location of the club, and I came down what's left of Plattsville and figured out that probably this is about where it was, somewhere in here, because the connector would have to go from this street over to this street. In 1938, and this is the next one here, um, we have a picture of the field day. The clubhouse was at that time a fixed up chicken coop, believe me or not. I doubt if we had to pay any rent. Joe is continuing here. We met once a month, and here's the 1938 field day picture with 10 early members of the club, including Joe Strollen. You can always pick Joe out because you see those teeth? They show up wherever he has a picture. That shows up, so you don't have any trouble identifying. <coughs> also, we had another rather unusual guy in that group, Father Knight, who was uh, at the local seminary. <coughs> Bill Bayless, who some of you know and is still living, uh, was also a member of the club. 
And the license that you see there is Joe Strollen's uh, ham radio membership card. <clears throat> Joe said he attended several field days at a spot up in New Canaan with other members. One of them was James Fay, who had a rather interesting call number, W1KWF, Kilowatt Fay. It was Fay who introduced myself and Art Riley to Ham Radio. Jim lived on Chapel Street, Norwalk, and naturally had, guess what, a kilowatt CW transmitter. For a while after the war, the club met at the Red Cross building on Maple Street, Norwalk. I became very inactive after the war and did not rejoin Gene Art until we were meeting at the old Norwalk High School, now City Hall. The most active amateur radio club in the area before the war was the Connect Connecticut Brass Pounders with club rooms in Norroton. The best amateur radio club I ever belonged to was the Connecticut Wireless Association. Bill Hart was also in that group. We met at different restaurants once a month with excellent programs. Roger Geiler, that's known, who you knew as Frenchy, and who we still know as Frenchy, he's alive and well, was also a member of that club. In an email to Rich Rosnoy on March 27, 2001, Bill Bayless, W1AXB, added some more background on the early club. Here's Bill Schoen teaching one of his many code classes in later years. He goes on to say that Judd Bodicott, W1PEA, was a member in 1938 or 39, and the club was already running at that time. He was in high school, but seems to think that it may have started a few years earlier. I can remember quite a few of the members, but Billy Premru and I became members around 1939. Bill Boncall from Westport was president at that time. The clubhouse was located on York Street in Norwalk. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had a wood-burning stove, and it was the duty of one of the members to get there early to start the fire in the winter. Did anybody start our fire today? <laughs> okay. Um, the clubhouse was probably 15 by 15, but we all managed to get in there. I think the dues, get this, were 25 cents a week, and after the meetings we would go bowling, and that was 25 cents a game. Bill Anderson, W1QBO, from East Norwalk, was the local FCCRI and his job was to catch bootleggers, and there were plenty of them, including me. We also had a priest, Father Knight, who I mentioned earlier, from the seminary in West Norwalk. Joe Strollen was one of the early members, along with Bob Dunn, who worked for the phone company. <clears throat> this gives you some idea of the kind of people that were members of the club. Art Riley was there when I joined. We also and Bill, Bob Dunn, who worked for the phone company. We also had a fellow by the name of Fred Bloor, who was a master builder of radios. He could build a rig, and you would swear that it came from the factory. Fred tried a number of times to get his license, but just could not master the code. His last attempt was when he drove Billy Primrose down to the federal building in New York. And unfortunately, Billy passed and Fred failed. I think that Fred, that was Fred's last attempt. We also had Doug Rowe, who was one of the, was in the radio repair business in South Norwalk. His shop was called Rowe Radio. Carmen Serenio and his brother were also members. Marty Lee, a salesman from Cash's Woven Level Labels. You all know Cash's. Never heard of him. Um, he was another old time member. I th he thought Art Riley married Marty's sister. Don Garish was Bill Vonkal's brother in law. 
and we called him Oot for short. He was a big guy, and they called him Blimp, which was mean, but he didn't mind the handle. There were so many other hams in Norwalk, the surrounding times, towns might have been, who might have been members. A ham by the last name of McMahon was famous for his QSL designs. And oh yes, Bob Wickey of East Norwalk. I remember him well because he borrowed my power supply to use in his two and a half meter rig and then sold the car with my power supply still wired in the trunk. <laughs> he made amends by giving me his rig. LOL, it was a TR4. Well, Rich, that's quite a bit of rambling. He was relating this to Rich. But ham radio was so much fun in those days. When the bands were shut down, many of the guys started fooling around with wired wireless. We used to send and receive over the power company lines. Actually, some of the guys, uh, actually, some of the guys worked outside the state. Even when I was on board the USS Griffin, I was building super regen rigs to use after the war. But of course then things had changed. I remember bringing an old Buick generator to the ship and stripping it. With the help of the chief electrician, I rewound it, added slip rings, and I was going to use it in my 1937 Ford to power my super regen two and a half meter rig. Unfortunately, my father needed room in the garage and sold the Ford <laughs> and told me that he would help me buy a new car when I decided to come home. Kind of sounds like he had some bad luck with friends and fathers. As I mentioned before, Billy Primrou and I joined about 1939. Not long after that, the amateur was told to stop operating and the bands were shut down until 1945, just after the bomb dropped on Japan. I immediately fired up the 1KW rig on the ship and was bootlegging all over the world, lol. Guys in South America were begging me for QSL cards. In another communication titled, Whoever Said Gimme the Good Old Times Days, Bill Bayless added some more memories. I used to get to the club from East Norwalk on my two-wheel bike. I was around 14 or 15 years old at the time, and it was the only way my parents would let me out of the house in the evening. Billy Premru moved to Florida after the war and became chief of police in Largo. Although the clubhouse was converted a converted chicken coop, it also had a basement. We kept our excess equipment there I do recall that on rainy days, the atmosphere got a bit heavy. <laughs> Two meters was just beginning to get popular and everybody was building super regenerative receivers. With a couple of minor changes, we could also transmit with the same rig, sort of like a transceiver. Hi. Many of us went to separate transmitters, two rods a quarter wavelength long, one rod tied to the plate of the triode, and the other rod to the grid. Tuning was accomplished by a very sophisticated system, sliding a shorting bar up and down the rods. We modulated the thing by placing a choke in the B-plus lead and fed audio into the circuit with a small one-tube amplifier. Amazingly, we did get out. In those days, all the kids used to bootleg, and I remember working some DX in Stanford, Connecticut. We were all afraid of Roger Amundsen, the local RA. We all believed he would even turn in his mother-in-law. <laughs> so we had to use extreme caution. As time went on, we got closer and closer to the war. Bill Von Call, president of the club, was fire chief in Westport, Connecticut. He was very upset with the English. He had a much stronger way of expressing his views in those days. Anyway, he said they were going to get us into the war. Well, he was not wrong. The war was on and in full blast when I was just about to graduate from high school. With my dad's permission, I joined the Navy and went on active duty in October of 1942. In this section, the way we were was under the heading of on the alert. 
newspaper ran a picture showing uh, members of our, showing uh, people who were involved in 1941 and the nation, not yet involved in the war that was raging in Europe, took precautionary steps. Among those was setting up lines of communication uh, as ham radio operators in Norwalk used their talents to aid the civil defense effort. In a follow-up communication with Don Hudson on February 27, 2012, Bill Bayless added, I got out of the Navy in 1946 and hung around, but then went back in and ham radio sort of went by the wayside. I got back to Norwalk in 1950 and back into the radio club. I can't remember where we were meeting at the time. Some of the original members that come to mind are uh, Bill Dunn, Marty Grace, Bill Premru, Art Riley, Phil Rand, Bill Von Call. All of those except Bill Premru were deceased at the time that I talked to Bill. We move on now to the time between World War II and 1967. For a while, the club met at the Red Cross building on Maple Street in Norwalk and apparently dissolved. According to Rich Bayless, seen here at his current station, an extensive interview with Don Hudson in 212, 200, 2012, there was an attempt around 1957 to form a club meeting at the Red Cross building on Mont Avenue. The group included Rich and others. They thought that Norwalk should have a ham radio club. Unfortunately, Larry Wood, who was one of those, died in a small plane he was piloting. This initial attempt to form a club apparently faded away. However, as covered in this October 1960 newspaper article, the reprint shown here, the Norwalk Amateur Radio Society, as it was now known, held its first election of officers and announced the next meeting at the YMCA on Mount Avenue. Among those assisting in the formation of the society were again Rich Bayless, who is with us here tonight, along with John Ferrer, president, Paul Manners, vice president, Cliff Peterson, treasurer, and Dick Kruzman, secretary. Fifteen other men were listed as assisting in the founding of the organization. Barney Corwin, attending Syracuse University, was to be assisting the editorial staff of the group's monthly newspaper. Rich served as chief engineer, monitoring and supervising the club station K1 UDT equipment. The club's defense equipment uh, the, the club's civil defense equipment included several Gonset communicators. It was stored at the Lockwood Mansion Gatehouse, which became the club's meeting place. This building on West Avenue in front of police headquarters was later used as the Norwalk tour Tourist Office. Cal Bennett, W1KHL, the local CD representative, was instrumental later in getting the club's antenna mounted on the Lockwood Mansion, as shown here. One of the many club activities was field day, held at such locations as Cranberry Park in Norwalk and West Rocks Middle School, also in Norwalk. This field day 1961 montage displays the many activities that to this day continue to be needed for a successful club event. So you can study that for a moment. It probably all looks very familiar to you. In the 60s as today, field day was a Saturday Sunday event. 20 to 25 members participated, operating on 6, 10, 15, 20, and 40 meters. AM and CW. The bands were crowded. Six meters quite hot. Some of the equipment labels were Atlas, Drake, Johnson, and Viking, along with converted art fives. Collins was one everyone fell in love with. Extra points were given as now for CW contacts. Rich was primarily on CW in the early morning 
and nights is speed around 35 words per minute. Rich had moved from novice to tech, which required two years as a novice. Hence his experience and proficiency with CW. His home equipment was a night transmitter and an AR3 receiver. He loved building equipment, especially transmitters. He especially enjoyed watching the shades of plate glow and meltdowns of 807s. <laughs> he was too young to go to New York City, so he did not get his general license until 2005, well after he returned from military service. As noted earlier, the club got tied in the CD. Cal Bennett, as the Norwalk CD representative, was in charge of this connection. The few club members involved met on the top floor of the aforementioned Lockwood Mansion Gatehouse. Rich recalled riding with the National Guard to provide communications assistance to the fire, police, Red Cross, and Guard personnel in flood and similar emergencies. Looting and related disturbances were quite a concern. Carrying arms was an individual option. Just as a deterrent, Rich had his 22, the instruction being, don't shoot it. As to meeting programs, Rich recalled doing two meter field tests, determining the maximum operating range from the base station before there was a repeater, Projects were major were the major meeting activity, including solving members' construction problems, servicing members' equipment, and building activities like small transmitters and QRP transceivers. Also, members would build and service squallows and hollows, i.e., two and six meter equipment. Another project activity was fox hunts. There were virtually no speaker programs. The group's interest was primarily in learning and doing. One especially unique club activity was covering balloon racing at Shady Beach in Norwalk. The hams would visually track a balloon until it came down and then relay the location back to the launch site to deploy the chase car. They also did some tracking by boat, some balloons landing on Long Island. Luckily, one member's father owned a boat. The club's communication support was all there was because the balloon group's radios had very limited range. Rich noted that what the club did was amazing considering the little equipment it had compared to now. Also important was participation in the ARRL, including members, as shown in this picture, Bill Bayless, Cal Bannock, Art Riley, Joe Stolen, Strolen, along with Claire, now deceased, and Roger Frenchy Geiler, attending the 1964 New York National Convention at the New York Hilton, honoring the 50th anniversary of the ARRL. By that time, the club was referred to as the Norwalk Amateur Radio Club, not society. Rich had to leave the club in 1965 for military service. Many years later, Rich got back into ham radio with the current club. In the meantime, the 1960 club faded away, leaving behind its constant communicators, affectionately known as goony boxes, and other assorted stuff, per Paul Dancer's inventory. <laughs> as an example of how ham operators could contribute their special talents in military service, a brief coverage of Rich's experience follows. Upon entering the Army, he was rejected for operator radio school uh, because his code speed was too high, 35 words per minute. And the Army insisted on training recruits its way. Even though he had the highest code test, he ended up in heavy weapons instead of communications. Now, this is the Vietnam War, and he was shipped out to Korea. Rich was not about to resign himself to carrying a mortar on his back in the field. He started by cultivating some connections in his unit headquarters by getting some equipment, that is a Heathkit DX-100, 
and the national NC-183D up to speed for some guys in that group. One of his big achievements was setting up communications from headquarters to Seoul back to the United States, station H9KO. A headquarters bird colonel had a wife who was expecting, and the delivery news came to him through Rich and his radio links. The colonel was so happy that he cut orders right then and there to transfer Rich to headquarters to be in charge of the unit's communications as a radio mechanic. And here, whoop, Rich, yep, there he comes. No, he, they just took it off. <laughs> oh, here's Rich with his maintenance vehicle. Later in 1965, he set up the unit's first manual repeater on a mountaintop, linking the headquarters to platoons in the field. He could connect these locations with his mobile rig and then relay deployment orders, thus experiencing direct involvement with the ground forces at the 38th parallel. Rich served out the remaining year of his two-year commitment in this communication assignment. And now we move to the final section. On April 10, 1992, Paul Danzer, N1II, Paul is seen here walking with his dog and operating his handheld, true multitasking. He prepared a report for the history file addressed to E. Old Editor. He opened with his usual humor, humor by noting this, that the second thing that fails is memory. Oh well, I guess that's your problem, according to Paul. Anyway, here is an early, the early history as I call think I related it to Toy Ellison over the phone. Or perhaps not. I don't remember. Anyway, I remember meeting Bob Goldenweider, Norwalk Director of Civil Defense in the late 1960s. Say 67 or 68. I looked him up in the phone book because as a ham, newly moved to Norwalk in 66, I was used, I was used to participating in CD. Calling the CD director was a natural thing to do. Bob said there was just one volunteer ahead of me, Ken Lee, W-A-1-O-T-Y, who had just gotten his license. At that time, I don't think Ken even knew another ham. He got his license by studying by himself, based on a Navy radio background. He was that kind of guy. Bob Bolenweider, who later got a novice license through one of our classes, set up a meeting with Ken and myself. Bob supplied a list of the old Norwalk Radio Club members, whose roots were probably before World War II and certainly into the early 50s. Per other sources, Paul was essentially correct on this. One of, our, of us called, according to Paul, ARRL, who sent a list of local hams in the surrounding towns, times, towns, and we put out a mailing list for me. On the list of the old club were Joe Strollen and Bill Bayless and some others. Apologies to those I've forgotten. Some of you might recall some other names from that group, based on earlier communications. We held a meeting per the flyer. The attendance was small, maybe 10 with few of the old club people. I ended up being assistant CD communications officer with Ken having at least one of the other officers. CD and the new club headquarters were in the basement of the old Norwalk High, as we noted already now in New City Hall, on East Avenue at Sunset Hill Road. Later meetings were held in the library. The previous location was the Lockwood Mansion Gatehouse, now used as the Norwalk Tourist Office on West Avenue, just in front of the police headquarters. The CD ham call, W1WHZ, was inherited from the old days. A couple of years later, when Joe Beck, WA1RXA, became trustee of the call, he put it on his car's license plate. Many of the local hams who calls in the WA1 series 
came through GNARC's novice courses in the 70s and the early 80s. In February 20, on February 22nd, in a February 22nd, 2012 report, Norwalk Civil Preparedness and GNARC, the early days, Hall reiterated that GNARC was resurrected in the late 1960s in conjunction with the city of Norwalk, Office of Civil Preparedness, later known to most of us as the old, uh, better known to most of us as the old Civil Defense, or CD. Left over from preceding Norwalk radio clubs, as we noted earlier, were boxes of decaying paper, some junk, and several guns and communicators. There was one communicator four, one or two threes, and several twos. These were compact little units putting out about a few watts on two meter AM. Once the club was reestablished, it began to support CP, civil preparedness, activities with monthly communications drills. One concert was left at CP headquarters, and the remaining ones parceled out to various members for the drills. A simplex frequency was used. In roughly 1972, the Norwalk repeater was put on the air. Since it operated on narrowband FM, the communication communicators could not be used as they were. However, this was a common problem for communicator owners across the country. Someone developed a quick fix for the transmitter, which consisted of disconnecting the AM modulator and feeding a small amount of audio from the mic amplifier stage to the crystal oscillator, resulting in workable NBFM modulation. The tunable receivers had AM detectors, but were very wide band. With a receiver like that, it was possible to tune just off the side of an MBFM signal and record the usable audio in a process known as slope detection. After each of the communicators was modified, a one-man job making about taking about an hour or two each. It was then put into service for the monthly CP communications drills. But this time through the Norwalk repeater, W1WHZ. Later on, as more and more hams purchased what we now know as two-meter radio <coughs> and appeared on the repeater, the gonsets, gonsets were put aside and scrapped. In a follow-up reporter, First year on the repeater, Paul said, I recently came across a stack of my old log books and found pages used in the very early days of the Norwalk repeater. In those days, a log book was kept that detailed time, date, power, and band on each contact. It even included every unsuccessful CQ you sent and every test transmission. My first repeater contacts were made with the heat kit tour, modified from AM to narrowband FM. Since the tour receiver employed a super regenerative design, it could not be used. So an inexpensive AM VHF monitor called the Patrolman, 12 bucks at Radio Shack, was used in a slope detecting mode for listening. This station ran all of one watt according to the law book. It required constant retuning of the VHF monitor, which was not too stable and certainly not designed for this use. The first QSO logged with Ken, WA1OTY, was on October 28, 1972, at 11.15 a.m. local time. In addition to being a co-finder of the current GRC, he was one of the co-founders of the newer Walk with Peter. Log, the logbook notes the QSO was via W1WHC. In the following year, QSOs were logged with 26 stations. In addition, a few AM contacts were log, logged, suggesting that the Heathkit tour was still being used, at least for this first year of the Norwalk with Peter. In follow-up conversations by Don Hudson with Rich Rosnoy, Rich Bayless, and Paul Danzer, Danzer, the story of the use of the Nike site in Westport was clarified. 
thank God, the area became available to the public in the early 1970s and subsequently had some field day use. Paul is seen in these shots in his Mickey Mouse t-shirt handling his supervisory activities in a very dignified way for the 1974 field day. Pictures surprised, uh, provided by his ex-friend, Rich Rosnod. Rich Bayless recalled camping out at the missile silos, actually using one to hang antennas. The major source for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all oh, these guys wouldn't admit it to me, appears to have been a big keg of beer. <laughs> Paul recalled how heavy the tents were and that one structure on site was infested with snakes. You guys got it easy these days. Don Hudson asked Paul if he had any additional unusual experiences to report, and he did. This was his story, titled A Memorable Field Day, Ham Radio Can Be a Serious Business. It was a few hours before the start of field day and the Gene Art Club was setting up its stations behind a church on Richards Avenue. The church allowed our using the area due to the influence of one of our members who was a prominent member of the church board. The wire was laid out to make an 80 meter dipole and two Gene Art members were discussing where and how to put it up. One participant was a current officer of the club, and the other a former officer of the club, both longtime members. The discussion grew heated, escalated to shouting, we don't have that problem anymore, and the noise attracted a number of bystanders. The two participants both grew angry, very angry, but fortunately cooler heads prevailed just as the confrontation became physical. And they were able to separate the hams before bowls were exchanged. Well, what's wrong with this picture, says Paul. One of these hams had been released from the hospital earlier in the week after a serious heart attack. The other ham let it be known that his cancer had spread with a prediction of six months and certainly not as long as a year to live. <coughs> Unfortunately, the prediction proved true. And they were about to come to blows about an 80 meter dipole. Ham radio can be a serious business, perhaps too serious, according to Paul. Joe Beck, who was licensed in 1973, was honored in the news for his work monitoring and relaying messages from service personnel in the Persian Gulf and other military areas to their loved ones back home. In 1974, he became a licensed member of the Military Affiliate Radio System. I always want to know what Mars is good for. Mars, as it's known. As covered in this news picture of Joe handling Mars messages. The minutes from the November 9, 1977 meeting an excerpt shown here, suggest a wide range of activities for the by then Greater Norwalk Radio Club. Notice the addition of the word greater. Including, it just had some mention of it, but, but the total new minutes showed a series of monthly speakers, the need for individual members to set up speakers, that sound familiar? Reminders as to obligations for having the privileges of a ham license. Does that sound familiar? Reports on FCC actions, recent interesting DX contacts, equipment needs, needs, sales and trades, and important social activities such as the annual Christmas party. The minutes from the March 14, 1984 meeting continue to show a variety of club activities. They're not all in this excerpt. With discussions of repeater interference from stations using higher or high power 
CD Tone Alerts and Refunds. I wonder how many of you remember what that is. Membership cards, field day location options, a possible mini DX expedition to one of the Norwalk Islands, speaker arrangements, and special events such as the MS Bike of Line. The most important matter was discussion of the proposed incorporation of GNR. It was voted down, but approved at a later meeting. Just in closing, my reaction, having gone through a lot of this and enjoying doing it, is what a testimonial this history is to the perseverance, creativity, and dedication of individual members. Some of the things they came up with, and some of the things they undertook. I'd like to acknowledge some contributions to this presentation. It's made possible by the contributions of many dedicated members of the club. Toy Allerton for his contact with Joe Strollen, contact with Joe Strollen and Paul Danzer, and his general review of the rest of the first 50 years. Rich Bayless for his interview on the renewal of the club in the early post-war period with him as a founding member. That was probably the most difficult period to get our arms around. Rich Bayless, who's alive and well, for his accounts and additional comments on the earliest history of the club. Paul Danzer, for his various reports on the ultimate late 1960s rebirth of the club under his leadership. <coughs> Roger Frenchy Geiler, for his providing some additional details on the 1960s transition of the club. And here's a special one. I was hoping she could be here tonight. Cindy Rosnoy, for her dedication as club archivist to collecting and preserving a vast treasure of letters, emails, minutes, articles, pictures, CDs, and videotapes on club activities covering the entire history of GNAR and its several predecessors. Rich Rosnoy, for his contact with Bill Bayless and his general review of the rest of the first Joe Strollen for his memories of the earliest history of the club. And last but not least, Tim Walker for his valuable support and editing of the whole project and finding his way through my complicated slides tonight. <laughs> including producing the critical backup disc of many of the visuals. Thank you very much. Now, one thing I could add here is, if it's all right with you, Rich, and you, Paul, and you, Toy, and Tim, and anybody else to uh, answer questions about this first 50 years, why, uh, you know, fire away, if you have any. Paul doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what the tone thing was. What? Credits for the tones. Yeah. Credit for the what weather. Was that, like the a, fines. You know, the what fine. happened what happened was we were selling very inexpensive regular work receivers. So we bought about fifteen of them. Changed the frequency to uh, some simple frequency. So when you happen to get a hold of all the club members, you get a touch to get a phone and all the receivers went off in everybody's house. That was fine, so it was too slight, it was a very slight problem. If you roll home, the tone stayed on, driving you go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what it led to was a number of sort of set up systems where you could pull other people individually by just building 555s as tone detectors. You would do a frequency detector, so you could use those to pull your friends. But that was still the key. Other questions? I have one I'm sort of, I have to ask because I'm embarrassed about this. On the cover slide here, it shows two calls, W1EB and W1NLK. And I went back to my notes that I've gotten from the history all the way up to 1989, and I can't find 
N1EV. Do any of you guys remember what that is? Yeah. That's Evelyn. Evelyn. Evelyn Gross. Evelyn Gross. Okay. Her wife. Very good. Tim, you know that. You could have answered that. That's her first wife. Okay. Yeah. Uh, USA. She was a CW addict. Oh, yes. And made I remember her extra long before her husband. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Put the lights back on. Marty, you want to hit the lights? Marty, thank you. Has <coughs> anyone missed signing the condolence card? Well, it goes to you.